Hey, everybody. Welcome to Before College TV Live. We are here with Duke University students. Hello, Duke panel. How are you doing? Good. Good. Pretty good, you look, yeah. You're, you're very excited. I'd love to learn more about your college experience um, going back to high school and when you started this experience at Duke. Uh, Jamal, you smile when I mention high school. Uh, I want to know, tell me about high school, Jamal. Tell me about your dreams. Tell me about how you passed your time. Uh, were you popular? Were you a guy who just blended into the background? How did you even think Duke? You know, you're going to go to Duke. So take me back to high school and tell me about high school, Jamal. Yeah, high school, Jamal. Um... Well, I went to STEM high school, so I was, you know, a math and science, like, person, like, um, more so science, actually, um, and I actually study history at Duke, so it's a little bit of a deviation, but I did take those, like, STEM courses at Duke, and I did enjoy them, but mm -hmm. I just preferred history, um, so that's the first thing, so I was more science-oriented um, in high school. I did do debate, so I was always, like, this kind of arguer, so it's kind of like a natural, um, a natural segue into what I study now. Uh, and I found the quest question funny about like, how did I decide, like, you know, Duke. <laughs> um, this is gonna sound very cocky, very pretentious, but it is the truth. Um, I actually only applied to Duke because someone said I couldn't get into Duke. So I was like, why not just apply? <laughs> and like, so um, then, you know, obviously I got in. Um, so that was, that was nice. Um, I was also very frantic, so I didn't know a lot about the college process, as like many of my peers on this call will vouch for. So I applied to 22 different institutions um, because I was like, you know what, one of them has to let me in because I was very nervous. Like I didn't, I know that on paper I looked fine, but I was like, what does all of this mean in the greater scheme of things? Like, so I was very frantic, but you know, that was high school Jamal, I guess. Like, and if, was I popular? I was class president, so like people voted for that. <laughs> You're persuasive enough to to have that happen. Then when it came to going through the process, I know you're a first generation student, uh, going through the application process, filling out the FAFSA, um, was that easy for you? Was that overwhelming for you? Um, the FAFSA was pretty intuitive. I think it was a CSS profile that was, that was a beast um, within itself because they asked for so much more information than what the FAFSA does. I think it's also a problem communicating with uh, your guardian or guardians, uh, specifically like, you know, I need this specific documentation and they could probably question you as to why um, and not necessarily understand why certain documentation or like the security behind it. Because I think there's this like, ominous um, view of like oh my god what if like you're uploading to like a fraudulent site and my identity is stolen and so it's just uh, a bunch of you know really actually explaining and being like oh this is actually legitimate this is how i can get financial aid uh, i was lucky enough to not my my guardians were not overbearing they kind of let me do the process uh, as i as need be so that was you know fortunate of me i think but you had to be the one to take the initiative. You had to be the one to fill out the forms. Uh, at your school, was there a counselor who helped you? Was there an organization for students to support you? I'm sorry. I feel like I like everything is told in my face. So as soon as you said that, I went like, <laughs> because here's the story. Here's the tea. Um, <laughs> Give it to us. The, the counselor that I had, there were two counselors. There was one like your designated counselor. And no then, names, though. No names. I'm not saying names. Oh, no. no. <laughs> um, and there was another counselor that was new to the school, and she was supposed to be a college counselor, like an actual college advisor. Uh, my regular counselor, I needed a recommendation letter from her. And I said, oh, can you upload your recommendation letter to the Common App? And she looked at me, and I kid you not, she was like, what is the Common App? Because I went to a high school that, you know, the average ACT score is a 15.9. Um, about 20% of the student body ends up going to a two-year, four-year, or vocational institution. So that's 20 going to just those places. So the percentage that is actually going to a four-year institution is very slim. Mm -hmm. um, so it was an abnormal request. Um, and that's something that you really figure out with the inequities in education that, you know, there, is, there are schools where individuals 
counselors don't know the Common App or don't know how to use that interface. Um, and it's not a relatively new interface. So colleges have been using these platforms to get applications for years. So the fact that my request for a recommendation letter um, on that platform was met with confusion is very alarming. Right. Um, as for the college advisor, she got there my senior year, as I said, she didn't know me. Um, I kind of told her the schools that I wanted to get into. And she was like, oh, why not Mizzou, which is our state school? And I was like, well, I don't want to go to Mizzou. Like, that was the simple answer, the simple fact. Um, so I was met with a lot of just kind of like, well, we're not going to really waste our time with those applications because these are not schools that you can get into. So, so you applied to 22 schools. So were some of those schools that no one had applied to? You know, were, they, were there a lot of Ivy schools? What, what was your range? And did yeah, you um, I applied to mostly, I applied to 11 liberal arts schools because I thought I was going to go to a liberal arts school. So like your Amherst, um, your Pomona's. Um, I applied to like 11 research institutions and four Ivies um, and Duke and Northwestern, so. And any rejections that were devastating? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> not, not devastating, actually just a deferral. Just a deferral was devastating. So um, I actually ended up getting into 19 of the 22 schools. Wow. Uh, thank you. Um, so I really, I kind of, my whole community rallied me to want to go to Princeton. Um, and initially it wasn't my top choice, but I kind of like, it became my top choice. So I was deferred early action. And I remember crying for like four hours went to sleep crying, woke up crying. Like, it was like, I was very upset with, with the decision. Um, and then I went through the entire application process waiting for Princeton. It was my last decision. Um, and I ha had not received a rejection until Ivy Day. Um, so I didn't get into Princeton or Penn, but I did, did get into the other two Ivies that I applied to. Which so. were those? Uh, Brown and Dartmouth. Exciting, but you decided to go to Duke. Yeah. Interesting. And then I'm, I want to talk to Sarah and Taylor about your high school experience, but why, why did you pick Duke? Well, what was the thing that made that the, the, the best choice for you? Yeah, so I actually had the opportunity to visit um, all, of the, all of the schools that I was deciding between. So it came down to Brown, Duke, and Northwestern. Brown just, I think you are often told the story of you're going to go to a college campus and you're going to know you fall in love with it. Actually, like, that never happened to me, but uh, when I went to Brown, I knew that I didn't fall in love with it. I knew that I didn't really like it, uh, and it just didn't fit with me. Um, the first time I've heard that, before, like <laughs> someone not falling in love with Brown, so. <laughs> it, just, it just was like something I was like, oh, you know, um, it, it felt like a lot of people, well, no, that's a shade to Brown. I'm not gonna shade Brown like that, but it just wasn't the cool for me. Okay, uh, okay. And then Northwestern, I actually loved Northwestern, but I was talking to my, um, to my host. And so this happened at both Brown and Northwestern where I was like saying the other schools I got into and they were like, oh my God, you got into Duke. Like, you should probably go to Duke. Like, the Northwestern so it, person told you that you yeah. should. <laughs> so so I, it was Dang. kind of an indicator. And I was like, you know what? Like, I love that. And Duke also, um, and then I'll, I'll stop talking and let you talk to Taylor and Sarah. Well, I uh, keep asking the questions. It's me. <laughs> uh, uh, I had a great financial aid package from all of the schools uh, and, and Sarah's on my scholarship program here at Duke. But um, so I actually paid nothing to go to Duke, like not a dime. Um, and they gifted us a laptop. So that was something that I didn't have a laptop in when I was in high school. So I actually wrote all of my college admission essays on a cracked phone screen. So I was like, I didn't know if I could see like the, er the errors in like my messages or anything like that. Um, so having a laptop and having something that was like, okay, I can actually start school off on the right foot. And they also offered to fly one of your guardians out uh, to visit campus. So being a first generation student, I think the idea of having my mom see campus um, and the campus that I was gonna be living in that was 800 miles away and have her feel a part of my college process was very meaningful. So I felt like Duke cared for its students um, and cared for even me, like who wasn't even a student yet um, before I even made my decision. So it really made it easier because my heart was there. Yeah, I have to just ask you, you went through your entire application process filling out your essays 
on a cracked screen, a cell phone screen? You did everything on a cell phone? Yeah, so I could, could go back to school and edit them on a laptop, but when I like initially wrote them at home, they're, they were on the cracked phone screen. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's a great story. Okay, Sarah, let me hear a little bit about high school Sarah, who you are, <laughs> where you're from. Let us, let us understand what it was like to be in your life up to now. Well, not up to now, but, you know, up to <laughs> making that college decision. Yeah, sure. So um, I, in high school, was in the International Baccalaureate Program. Um, that is kind of um, a funnel to college, really. Um, I, I think that's kind of like their, my school's main priority when they're thinking about what students are going to college is usually those students in the IB program. Um, and it, it kind of, I mean, it made sense for me. I was always kind of one of those overachiever students. Um, I remember like in middle school, we had to do reading logs or we had to read a certain number of pages and I would always go like, I would always read double the amount of pages we had to read that kind of thing. I was always that kid. Um, so it, it made sense for me and um, my parents, you know, from a very young age instilled this notion that like there's an expectation that I'm going to college. Um, so that was never a question in my mind. I, I knew I was going to go. I just kind of didn't really know how that worked. Um, so yeah, I, I went through that and then um, I didn't really start thinking about college um, or, or, you know, even make a list of what colleges I was interested in until like the summer before senior year, um, just because I didn't really understand how that timeline worked. Um, so I ended up only visiting four schools. Um, I visited UF um, and Florida State. Uh, and then I also visited uh, Duke and UNC just because it's 20 minutes away and you know, why not? Uh, <laughs> And UNC is the only one I really didn't like. Um, I mean, it, it was just kind of, I don't want to, you know, it sounds like I already had a bias in mind. Um, but really, it was more of, you know, if you go visit Duke in the morning, and then you visit UNC in the afternoon, you know, you kind of, I'm just saying, you, I think, I think it kind of, you know, you're impressed in the morning, then you're like, oh, okay, this is like what a college looks like, a state college looks like. Um, and it's essentially the equivalent to UF, so I decided not to apply there. But yeah, I only applied to three schools, um, and I ended up applying to Duke Early Decision, um, in part because uh, in seventh grade I did that, you know, Duke TIP program where you can take the SAT, um, and if you get a certain score, you get invited to participate in their programs or whatever. Um, I couldn't afford to participate in any of their programs after doing that, but um, that kind of instilled a joke uh, between me and my dad where he was like oh well maybe when you go to college you'll go to Duke and I was like ah ha ha yeah right okay um but he was the one that suggested you know why don't we go visit Duke why don't you check it out and see if you like it uh so I, I guess he ended up being right in the end <laughs> yeah so, so um, what are the other what were the other two schools that you applied to UF and FSU okay and um when it comes to the financial piece and the final decision how did that factor into going to do? Well, um, I got my Duke decision first uh, because I applied uh, early decision. Um, and at that point, I had a pretty generous, um, you know, um, financial aid package. And, um, you know, it was kind of one of those things where we'd be able to manage and pay it um, without me being in like too much um, student loan debt, basically. Right. Um, and it wasn't until, I don't remember when, sometime in the spring, that I actually got a call from Duke uh, inviting me to take part in the Rubenstein Scholarship Program that Jamal was talking about. Um, it gives you a full ride um, that provides a lot of, you know, resources and connections, um, as well as um, a laptop, which was very, very, very helpful for me yeah. uh, as so, well. So. so that's amazing. So you get this call and you weren't quite sure that you were going to go down that path. How do you get invited to be a Rubenstein Scholar? Um, they basically just, I mean, you don't apply to any merit scholarships at Duke. Um, they just kind of contact you. Um, and so that's what happens. Um, usually you actually, I think for Rubenstein now you interview as well. Um, but for most of them you interview, um, they kind of select finalists and then talk to you and, um, sort of introduce you to campus as well. Um, 
but for ours, they just kind of contacted people and were like, hey, do you want to be a room and science scholar? And I would imagine pretty much everyone was like, yeah, oh my God. okay. <laughs> do, you wanna, like, do you want free everything in a computer? Uh, yeah. <laughs> let me think about that for a little bit. <laughs> right. That's amazing. So that's great. And I think for people who are watching this, who want, you know, who are afraid that money is going to be the thing that keeps them from going to college, I think it's fascinating to see that you applied, you got in, and it was... When did you get that call to be a Rubenstein, a Rubenstein, a Rubenstein scholar? Like, bef what month was um, that, just so we can understand? It was in the spring. So it, it was after I had um, accepted my offer at Duke. Um, it, it was maybe in March. Um, okay. I was a pretty late addition. Um, there were some of us that were pretty late additions. I th uh, Jamal, when did you hear about it? Um, so I heard mine's upon offer of admission. So when I got my admission letter um, attached to it was like this um, Rubenstein scholarship thing. And I, it was funny because like, again, like I didn't really expect to go to Duke. So I tried to actually just act out of the tab um, after my admission showed. And then it was just like, oh, here's the money. And I was like, oh, here's the money. And so I was like, okay, like let, let's keep talking. Um, so yeah, so I got mine's upon offer of admission. Yeah, that's that's great because I think it's it's something that a lot of people will 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 look at and limit themselves. When it comes to getting into the IB program, was anyone else in the IB program? By the way, was anyone else a, a international? I'm always afraid to say it. It's international Bacal baccalaureate, right? I said it right. Yeah. Oh, beautifully! Wow, I think it's, so <laughs> it's a fancy word. It's a whole fancy thing. It so, is. <laughs> so how did you know to go into that? So, if there's somebody who is in seventh grade or eighth grade or ninth grade, like how do you get into that? Sure, so um, it depends on the school. Um, at my old high school, um, you basically like apply. It used to be that um, you just, um, you know, signed up and they looked at like your academic record and they were like, okay, you can come here. Um, uh, now I believe, so the first two years are like pre-IB, um, and you take, uh, you know, specific classes with your IB cohort, but you're not like officially in the IB program because the high school IB program is two years long. It's your junior and senior year. Um, and so now I think at the end of their sophomore year, they have students actually apply again and write like an essay as to why they want to be in IB. Um, it's pretty short, like 500 words type thing. Right. Um, so, but I, I ended up going because we do school choice here. Um, and when I got back my uh, school assignment, it was um, just not a great school. Um, and my parents were really concerned about that because they wanted me to be in a big, in a good program because they knew, you know, they wanted me to go to college. Um, and so they looked around and they're like, well, you can go to this school that wasn't at the top of our list and you can automatically get a seat there if you apply to the IB program. Uh, and so that's what we did. Um, and I mean, I'm really glad I did, obviously, because it's, it's a really great program. It prepped me for college a lot. I mean, you write long essays, uh, you do presentations, you know, you have big exams at the end of your senior year. Um, and all of that is, you know, having to prepare for all of that and having to do all of that before college, serious advantage, especially yeah. for a, a first generation student. Yeah, that's great to know and really interesting. And I think the part that you had to take ownership, you know, even your even though your parents have been so focused on you going to college and Jamal, was college something that was really important from your, you know, for your uh, caregivers? Yeah, um, they definitely wanted me to go to college, but like it was just an abstraction, I feel, because um, college was Harvard and obviously I didn't even apply there. Uh, so I didn't really know about any real colleges until my sophomore year of high school, probably. Right. So it's interesting just to see, you know, where does somebody get turned on to this and where do they start believing that they can actually do it? And in your case, Sarah, even seeing how your parents were so college minded, but yet it wasn't until your senior year that you started to go through this when so many people mm -hmm. start that, you know, their sophomore year or their freshman yeah. year or we're doing test prep and all of this. So it's like they kind of knew, but you had to be the one to take ownership. And it, it seems like that's the trend in your life. It's like you have these dreams that are put there and you could do it, but I don't know how you're gonna do it. So you gotta figure it out. Or is yeah. that 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's accurate. So Taylor, um, thanks for being so patient. And um, of course. <laughs> you're just, you're wonderful and, and, and I appreciate it. And I would love for everybody to have a better understanding of you and what your high school experience was that led you to do. So I was actually in a magnet program. Um, so the way my like, my school system or like my county system works is that there's like, I think four or five different magnet programs that you could apply to. And all of them have different like themes, I guess. And so I applied to all of them. I got into all of them, but I ended up choosing one that was more like medicine focused. And mm -hmm. so the way that magnet program was set up, they basically like, they basically chose all my classes for me and all that other stuff. And they were more classes geared towards like prepping me to not only get into school, but to get into medical school as well. So um, that was a big part of my experience, but I didn't really start like prepping for college college until I think junior year, like late junior year. Cause back when I was like a first year in high school, I, I think the only school that I had in mind was Stanford for a number of reasons. And as I moved through high school, I realized that Stanford isn't the only school out there and I should probably look into other options. So I think I applied to 10 or 11 schools total. I got a lot of rejections. Ooh, good. I love, <laughs> well, we know, we know you go to Duke, so that's exciting. Can you share some of the schools that didn't uh, accept you? Knowing you got into Duke, it's fun. It's a fun game to play. Yeah, it is. So I applied to Yale, Brown, Stanford, did I apply to Harvard? I think I did. I can't. No, I didn't actually. I didn't apply to Harvard, but I applied to those three, and those are like my top three. And then I applied to like a majority of the state schools here in Georgia. Um, didn't get into Yale, didn't get into Brown, and I was like, okay, you know, that's fine, I guess. Stanford. <laughs> and I tell you, I was so upset about that because it was a that was the school that I had had on my list since like the very beginning. And the fact that I didn't get into it really just broke my heart in like a million pieces. And so I think I got Duke before I got Stanford. And when I got my Duke acceptance, I was like, oh, okay, this is cool, but I'm still waiting on Stanford. <laughs> right. And then I got my Stanford rejection and I was like, oh, this is terrible. But I still have Duke, so <laughs> it was good, I guess, yeah. And then Duke. now I'm actually in love with Duke, so I guess it was a great decision on their part. <laughs> I love that. When it came to the decision, well, I know that Duke was one of the best schools you got into, or at least one that excited you. When it came to the money part, because I, I love to help people to understand that, did that play a role in your decision? It played a significant role. I think Duke gave me the most money, but it still wasn't enough. And so the, <laughs> the way I have a particularly interesting financial situation because, because my, when you fill out the FAFSA, when you fill out the CSS profile, if both of your parents are like living and you have contact with them, you have to put them both on your um, application. And at the time I was really only being like helped by my mother, so to speak but I still had to report my father's income anyway. And so he makes enough to where it's kind of finicky. Like I still got full tuition and all that stuff, but I had to pay housing and like summer expenses and all this other stuff, which was like $15,000, $15,000 that I don't have laying around. So it got to the point where I almost couldn't even go to Duke because I could not afford that. And so I ended up having to take out a few loans in order to pay for my first year at school and then I got to school and talked to them and I was like yes this is what my financial situation looks like on paper but when I'm telling you I don't see any of this money like my parents cannot afford even though it says a particular number on paper my parents don't see that my dad doesn't see it even if he did see it I wouldn't get it anyway so <laughs> I talked to them and then that's when they told me at first, they were just like, oh, there's nothing that you can do. But then I like switch counselors, talked to some more people. And then my counselor, my newest counselor informed me that um, 
there was actually scholarships and programs in place for me to help me. So lately I've been just completely free. Like I don't have to pay anything anymore, which is awesome. grateful because I was tired of taking out loans. <laughs> so yeah. that's really good. So you, you were able to get money because you asked for help and then they mm -hmm. first replied with you. They first replied saying, no, you can't get it. But then mm -hmm. you kept asking. Is mm -hmm. that right? You're like, I want yeah, money. money. Literally, like whenever I had to fill out the FAFSA and CSS profile, it was the same thing. Like nothing had changed. Like everything was still the same and I still wasn't seeing the money. So they finally realized, oh, she isn't actually, she can't actually afford to be here. So let's help her out. <laughs> Yeah, and that's great. Your persistence and you put that out there. And, I, and I, I've worked with lots of students who come from low income backgrounds. And I know that that would be, I, I think, you know, you're also co president for Duke Life, low income first generation engagement, right? So mm -hmm. even in the leadership position you've taken on, uh, the low income component is visible. And I think sometimes students get uncomfortable with that label. Um, and then taking on, you know, that having the label and then using it to get resources. Um, I think it's unbelievable and so incredibly strong to be able to use that to get something great. Is, there ever a ch is that ever something that, that you struggled with or do you see people struggle with that or younger people struggle with? Well, for me personally, I didn't really have a label of like first generation or low income until I got to until I started like applying to school and like getting into school because in the like in the community that I grew up in like we were all we all had the same socioeconomic status like it was just normal for us and so then applying to school getting into school and being on campus with a bunch of other people who have very different levels of SES backgrounds made me realize like who I was and that label and how does that, and this is for all of you, and, and uh, anybody who is watching this who then discovers, oh my gosh, there's such a difference between the way I live and all of these other people, um, how do you reconcile that and work through that, especially dealing with a potential imposter syndrome? Well, I'm thankful for the Duke Life community, actually. I didn't actually know about it until I think the end of my first year at Duke. Um, and so having that label in the beginning was very like, not embarrassing, but like I knew that I couldn't do a number of the things that a lot of my other peers were doing because of my income. But then I found a community like me who shares similar like struggles and like celebrations as I do. And so that really helped me realize that even though sometimes I may feel like an imposter, I'm actually not. And I do deserve to be on this campus because I earned that right just as much as everybody else. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And, and Jamal, I know you're also part of Duke Life. Um, tell us a little bit about Duke Life and how you found Duke Life. Yeah, so um, we're all a part of Duke Life. Uh, Sarah, so, you are too. Yeah, Sarah is actually co-president. Yeah. She's my co-president. <laughs> we're <all laughs> co-presidents together. <laughs> you know, I have your all co-presidents. I, you know, what, the way I'm looking at my screen, I can see like some of some of that, but I didn't realize you're all. Well, you know what, Sarah, I am so sorry. <laughs> You deserve so much recognition for your co-president role as well. So thank you, and I apologize for that oversight. You forgive me. All right. You're very no funny. worries. Okay. Um, cool. But yeah, so they're actually the incoming co-presidents, and I was uh, I'm the outgoing co-president. That's uh, what it's okay. So I I actually was one of the founding members of the organization. Um, and I named the organization, um, so it stands for Low Income First Generation Engagement, LIFE. Um, and it kind of came out of an idea that uh, there's a need to like have a visible presence and actually like have a life and not just like a survivability aspect of college, like to have a living aspect and enjoyability um, to your existence. So that's where the name derives. And so for me, I found it really immediately. And there is a lot of, um, I guess, privileges associated to my finding of it because of the Rubenstein Scholarship community, which um, every Rubenstein Scholar is first generation. So um, kind of having that cohort and finding other individuals who were first generation was a lot easier for, for us to do. But then recognizing that there is a, that there was a stark divide between students who had the scholarship and students who did it and just recognizing that there's a need to bridge that um, was super important. 
So that's kind of where that came out of. And I quietly, like, you know, I didn't apply to be a part of the first executive board, which was our sophomore year, because um, I didn't feel ready. I didn't, didn't know if I, you know, could handle it. But then junior year um, or, or last year, I applied, um, was voted in, uh, and I think it was a very successful and an interesting year. So we had our first first generation low income week. Um, so a week dedicated to students on campus. Um, we like you know we had a conference, things things like this that that were just very much um, interesting and and really showed that we had a a livelihood on this campus and a place of belonging. And to answer your initial question, and then I'll be done. Uh, I always tell people all of the time when it comes to imposter syndrome that you will oftentimes hear uh, from, from people's parents, from your peers at institutions or your own inner doubts that you got in because you checked a box for first generation, you checked a box for queer, you checked a box for minority. But in reality, you got in in spite of, not because of those things. So that's, that's the truth to that. Yeah, I love that. And it's, it's amazing that you've created a community to help people to see that and reinforce that throughout their experience at Duke. Uh, Sarah and Taylor, as the co-presidents, the incoming co-presidents of Duke Life, is there something that you could share with those high school students who uh, have that dream but aren't quite sure that they can get there? Yeah, I think I would say I, the main thing that I've learned in my time at Duke is just like ask people questions. Um, and m m even more importantly than that, you know, just have conversations because I think a lot of times, even with things now going into my senior year, I don't know what I don't know. Um, and maybe that's the biggest struggle of all. You know, if you can reach out to someone and have them share what maybe they think that you need to know, that might also be helpful to you because that might spark those questions. Um, and that's kind of something that we're trying to, um, I think, encourage with advisors at Duke now. Um, we're actually, um, today um, and tomorrow, there are, um, there's this one GLI training for um, advisors, um, you know, so that they understand, you know, first of all, what do these identities mean? Um, and also what sorts of things do you need to keep in mind? Um, because people kind of make assumptions about you because you go to Duke, which is this, you know, overwhelmingly wealthy, you know, white um, uni uh, university. Well, if you don't, you know, meet those criteria and but they treat you the same as they would treat those students, they're not really meeting your needs. Um, so, you know, openly communicating those things, it's not shameful. Um, it's just part of who you are and, and it's something that is going to be a challenge, but again, you're, you know, you're going to be more resilient for it. Um, so that's, I think that's really important as well. Um, and in fact, we, you know, speaking of the, um, first generation awareness week that we had, um, last November, we basically got shirts that said like, I am one G slash I'm first generation slash low income, um, just to kind of openly display, you know, we have these identities, but you just can't see them, but they're important to how we experience Duke and you know, how different it is for us to walk campus than someone else. So. Yeah, that's wonderful. Taylor, do you have anything to add to that? Honestly, I would just say to not give up hope, I guess, because I guess like when you're coming from a community or background in which like your dreams may not be the same as other people's, it can be a little bit discouraging and to that i would just say don't give up because you do end up when you continue to like strive for your dreams you do end up achieving them they may not you may not achieve them in the same like linear path that you thought like you might get a few rejections like i did <laughs> you might have a few doors close on you but bigger better wider doors will always open up and you will end up achieving those dreams well, that's beautiful and you're all in students corners where if they have questions you're happy to answer them, right? Like legit, like you truly love helping. Um, and I think that the gift of COVID, because uh, for those who are watching this now, um, the idea that you have the remote learning, that you have you know, a different schedule, that you might be more available. And I was thinking, Jamal, about how if you're studying from you know, like 11 at night to four in the morning, 
you can do it in a Zoom room or you can do it through a Google Meetup or you can do it through some, some way where you're connected and you could, in, and you could invite somebody else. Like it's super easy to help people now. I think that's one of the things. It's like everyone's accessible. Like you're, you're all amazing. Okay, so I have some questions about what it's like to get on campus and to create a life for yourself in a new place surrounded by new people. So I wanna know, how did you make your first couple friends? You know, usually I'll ask three friends, you can do two or three, but Jamal, going back to you arrive on campus, you see these people, you don't know a lot of people, right? Because you didn't have any friends at Duke, right? No. You had no friends. Sarah, did you have any friends at Duke? No. No friends. Taylor, did you have any friends at Duke? I actually had one friend. You did. I was speak and <laughs> <I'm you>. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. So you had a friend. Okay, so that's okay. That's good. We could still learn about that friend. Doesn't disqualify you from the game. Uh, <laughs> but Jamal, so tell me, how did you make those first couple connections? A couple of ways. Um, prior to getting on campus, it's having group chats with people. So like group me or or group me is really the main platform that people use to have group chats. So all of the students, it's, here's a reminder, everyone wants to make friends. No one wants to come to campus and not have a friend. So if you're nervous about reaching out, you shouldn't be like everyone really wants to make a friend. And that's kind of the energy that I carried with me throughout like my entire time at Duke because I'm consistently making friends. Uh, just because, you know, talking to someone and having, like grabbing lunch with them, grabbing breakfast with them. Um, and I think when I got physically onto campus, it was doing those things. It was, you know, do you want to go out to lunch? Do you want to go out to dinner? And just not being afraid to ask. Um, Cause it's not a date, especially if you're like oh, the dining hall. So a lot of people <laughs> feel like it's, it's like, it's weird. Like, oh my God, wait, what if they misinterpret it? No one's going to misinterpret it. Like you're going to go, um, and have lunch and have dinner. And, you know, like I said, I consistently do this. I still do this um, to this day and I love it. And I love meeting new people. Do you get rejected ever? Um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> like, I mean, I think, I think people will be like, I can't come today. But if they're saying that they probably, we already probably know each other. Like if it's a new meetup, like we'll find a mutually convenient day. Um, and I don't think people are that bold. Uh, be like, oh no, I don't want to talk to you. Like, I just don't think people are that bold. Right, right, right. So, so just asking people and engaging with them. And were there any clubs or organizations that you participated in when you got on campus that helped you to find connections? Uh, <laughs> I do a lot. Um, <laughs> so I think when I first got to campus, I did spoken uh, word poetry, which is something that I didn't even do in high school. Um, I like, you know, a part of like speech and debate team as well, but like not like the competitive one, like the kind of chill acts one, because there's two. Um, because I was kind of done with competition at that point. Yeah. Um, I did try out two years, not one, two years, uh, for acapella groups, uh, but it didn't work out. Uh so that that's a form of rejection. Um and I, you know, I tried out for almost every single one that I was qualified for, besides like the religious one because I'm not personally religious. Um, so, you know, I tried out for like a, in a comedy group. I didn't make that either. Um, so I saw, I saw your interview with like Penn students as well. Like when I was prepping for this, the same kind of culture of like you apply to a lot of things at Duke is the, the one thing that I would change. So when you ask her like, you know, out of 10, like I probably get nine, 9.5. Like I love Duke. Right. But right. the kind of culture of like, you have to apply to every single little thing is so annoying. I'm like, can I just like do it because I want to do it? Uh, right. But you will eventually find your place. So I should ask you very cleanly because I asked Sarah in the beginning, I was going to go around and ask you all to share like your one out of 10. So if you were to rank your experience at Duke Jamal, what would you rank it? One out of 10, 10 being the best. Nine. A nine. I thought it was 9.5 before. I said 9, 9.5. <laughs> it fluctuates. It fluctuates. So 9.25 <laughs> as a solid state. I'm like, really listening, right? I just wanted to make sure. All right. So, so uh, Sarah, how did you find some of your first friends at Duke? Sure. Um, so through the Rubenstein program, um, I don't think they do this anymore, but um, we used to have a like six-week 
program before, um, like right before in July and August, okay. um, the first uh, semester. And basically you would take a class, be there with your cohort. Um, ours is pretty big, it's around 60 people. The other ones are smaller <laughs> than us. Um, there's a lot of people and you spend six weeks with them living in the same dorm. You know, you have roommates, you take a class together, um, you learn about all these resources together. Um, and I am like not an outgoing person at all. I'm very um, like self-conscious in social situations. Um, and so that was hard for me. Um, but I was really happy to be able to do that in a smaller environment. Um, and we still have something like that. We have our um, first generation um, orientation program. Um, and I hope that provides that for some students because I think it really helps me to have that smaller population to set out into first before being dropped onto campus with, you know, thousands of people. Um, so yeah, I, that's how, you know, that's how I met Jamal. Um, that's how I have our group of friends that I, we have to this day. Um, so yeah, that, I mean, that's how I initially met people. Um, and then in the fall, um, the main thing that helped me create friends is joining um, the Duke Chorale. Um, we're like a 50 person choir. Um, and we, we do a lot together, we sing together, you know, two hours, um, twice a week. Um, and we have we, I mean, in a typical year, um, we go away for a weekend together, like a little bit off, off campus and, um, you know, get to know one another and sing together. Um, we have a spring break tour where we go travel together and that's where a lot of the bonding happens. Um, but yeah, that's really where I became, um, that's where really where I got the majority of my other friends is through a sort of, again, a smaller, really close knit community. Yeah, that's, that's great. So Taylor, tell me a little bit about the places where you found friends. Um, well, I did have one friend before getting, we were both going to Duke, so that was good. And then through that friend, we kind of just like, we kind of split off and met new people. And then we introduced all of the people that we met to each other. So it was just kind of like a little, it wasn't a large friend group, but it was a pretty decent sized friend group. So the majority of my friends come from that. Um, also, I actually went abroad my sophomore fall. So when I came back from that, I had a completely different roommate. Um, and through that roommate, I met a bunch of other people who are now some of my really close friends. Um, so just a variety of ways to meet people. So divide and conquer seem to be your, your strategy. <laughs> and just so I, I can help everybody to understand. I talk a lot about places. Places are where you sweat, play, pray, live, learn, lead, love, and work. So places are where you do the things that you love to do, where you find connection and community. Jamal, you have a list here of places, but I'd love for you to rattle them off so you can just tell me your places. And one of the purposes for this is anybody who has any interest in any of these things could know somebody who's been in that place. So Jamal, give me your places. Um, Definitely uh, just in the student center, in the student center, just like hanging out, chilling uh, through debate, through uh, spoken, ver sp spoken word poetry, through uh, Duke Life, uh, through like the Black Student Alliance, uh, through Mi Gente, which is the Latinx Student Alliance, even though I don't identify as Latinx, uh, but they do welcome allies. Uh, just, you know, through all of campus, through the food court, because, you know, you got to eat. So those are my places. That's great. Taylor, tell me your places. Okay. Um, I guess study abroad, can I be yeah, considered let's a do place? It. I guess? Yeah, study abroad. I went to Venice, 10 out of 10, amazing. I love to talk <laughs> about study abroad. I'm a global education ambassador. Love to go abroad. Um, abroad, BSA, which is the Black Student Alliance. Duke Life, obviously. Um, I'm a member of Duke Swing, which is a dance club. Love that. Um, I'm also a part of Business Oriented Women, Duke Bo, uh, where else? My room actually is a place where I've made a lot of connections. I usually just keep my door open, invite people in. <laughs> um, where else? I think that's everything. Atlanta, obviously, is where I live. Um, yeah, I think, that's I think that's good. And we're going to have a list of your places so people can see, but I always like for you to share that. Sarah, tell me your places at Duke. Sure. 
I would definitely say the dining hall, 100%. I, that's where you get to know a lot of people. You run into people you don't see all the time that you're not, you know, in clubs with or, you know, in classes with. That's a great place. Um, you know, and like Jamal said, everyone has to eat, you know, <laughs> you have to sit down and do something for a certain amount of time. You might as well talk to someone while you do it. Um, so that's a really good place. Um, Duke Life um, and the Rubenstein Scholarship for sure. Um, and really for me, the big one too is, um, like I said before, Corral, um, that's just a, it's just such a big bonding experience, um, and a really wholesome group of people that I love. Um, other than that, um, I would also say to some extent, like libraries or like study rooms, I like to, um, you know, reserve a study room and then invite people to come study with us. And even if we're silent the whole time, you know, occasionally we, we take a break and break out into, you know, joking around with each other or just talking about what's on our minds. Um, that's a nice place too. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. I have, I have a few more questions for you. Are you okay with time right now? I don't want to be disrespectful. Are you cool? Because um, there's a few things, but one, one thing that jumps out, and this is just an aside that I wasn't really planning on talking about. It's like you're, you're, the three of you are so wonderful. I mean, like you're great. You're just, you give me such a great feeling. You're just like, you just want people to be successful. And this is where my heart breaks because so many of the things that you're talking about from Corral to doing the spoken word to the 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 first generation um you know week and celebration you know that's not going to happen this year the way it's happened in previous years um even forming a study group at the library like you can't form that study group and have that room and the fact that the juniors and seniors i think you said the juniors and seniors may not be on campus like that is so hard because you are the leaders you're the mentors you are the people who have been there and done it who have been in other people's corners who can talk about the experiences you had you know taylor someone could walk into your room and see pictures of you in in venice and wherever you were <laughs> and jamal and berlin and sarah seeing all of your incredible experiences the things that you do i'm trying to pull stuff for for you as, as well <laughs> um like your life work and, and your work with even even pictures of corral like what are you going, how can you help these freshmen and sophomores to tap into you and the things that make Duke so special? It's you. Like, have you thought about that and, and, and ways that you're going to do that to help them? Um, yeah, it's, it's been challenging. Um, one of the things is, that's really hard about it is that um, you really don't want everyone to be in video calls all the time um we have we've talked about this thing called zoom fatigue um i probably already have zoom fatigue and we haven't even started the semester because i'm in meetings all the time you know right. i have you know an, a summer internship and that has its own meetings separate of my duke meetings all that kind of thing um and i you don't you don't want to overwhelm people but at the same time you have to meet them somehow <laughs> um so that's been the really challenging thing is thinking of ways that are creative that people will actually want to do and that won't just contribute to their exhaustion. Um, and I've just kind of been trying to make myself open to everyone and saying, you know, if you like, I know I'm overwhelmed, but if you are overwhelmed or you have questions, come to me because I'm, I'm here for you. We can talk through it. I can give you the answers that I have. Um, but like, you know, no question too small kind of thing. Like I want everyone to feel welcome. Um, so, and, and hopefully we can accomplish that in some way. Um, and I mean, fingers crossed, we're all on campus in the spring. That would be yeah. amazing. Um, I don't know how realistic that is, um, you know, but uh, it's going to be a challenging year for that, for sure. Um, and I, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm hoping we can, I'm hoping maybe you know, talking about this availability thing of everyone's kind of sitting in their front of their computers and there's less transit time. So maybe you do have more availability. Maybe there will be more options for mentorship and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I don't know. In per no, ha not having in-person connections and face-to-face and -face interactions is going to be really hard. It is. But even you saying what you've just said and having people hear what you're saying it and knowing it's coming from such an authentic place, I think really sends a message that you are, you are here, you are present, you are committed, you want to help, right? Like, isn't that, is that accurate? Yeah. Um, when, when it comes, does anyone else have anything else to add? Does anyone have anything else to add to that before I move on? No? Okay. 
So I want to know about your most uncomfortable experience. I want to know the time where you thought, I don't know if this is going to work out. Um, you know what? I, I think I just can't do this. Or it could be the time where you're like, am I smart enough? You know, you just got a tough, tough exam, you know, something that surprised you. Cause I think a lot of us get to that place where they're like, should I stay here? Should I transfer? Is this for me? Can I keep moving forward? Is that something that any of you have dealt with? You could just give me a nod and I'll, and I'll jump jump to you. Um, Sarah, definitely you were, you, you can relate to that. So tell me about the time where you, you almost gave up or decided you were going to potentially leave. Well, um, I think one of the uh, more challenging things about being somewhere like Duke is um, going from a place where, you know, I talked about how I was kind of like that overachiever student, you know, going from a place where you were like, the quintessential one of the quintessential overachieving students to coming somewhere at Duke where pretty much everyone is exactly like you are <laughs> um, and you're no longer you know sort of at that top part you may be at the middle um, and it's really hard to grapple with um, even if you're someone like me who never really you know regard themselves as oh I'm this awesome student or whatever you still come to the realization that subconsciously you did think that way um, because it was the truth you know in your context um, and so some of the things I had trouble with were like, you know, getting application rejections while I was at Duke. Um, you know, if there was a club that I applied to, like the, um, the Model UN club, I was very involved in Model UN at my high school. And I didn't want to debate anymore. Um, kind of like Jamal said, I was really done with that kind of competition level stuff, not interested. Um, but I wanted to contribute to, say, their conference that they hold, or I just wanted to have conversations about international relations. Um, but I, you know, my application and interview whatever got rejected from that program. And so, you know, that was really hard. And then um, you, you get this feeling that you always have to be doing something and, that, you know, you're never quite achieving enough because uh, everyone is doing way more cool things than you are. Um, so, uh, and especially in the Rubenstein program, we get pushed to do things during the summer, um, in part because it contributes in this weird way to your financial aid situation um, in the following year, but that's, um, that's like not something we have to get into. But, um, but for example, I applied to um, a Duke Engage program um, in um, my freshman year and uh, I didn't get in and I, well, I applied to two of them and I didn't get into either of them. I interviewed for one of them still didn't get in and I was kind of in this place where I was like, well, <laughs> what am I going to do? Like, I'm not, I, applied and interviewed for these two things and I they didn't like me um what other options do I have I have no idea um and it was like a really hopeless <laughs> feeling for several weeks um and luckily um you know I had a couple friends who were doing study abroad um that summer um and I ended up applying to the programs that they were in and got into those um but sometimes yeah that's kind of where I have felt most hopeless in general is the fact that I just like don't know what other options I have. I feel like I've exhausted my options when really I don't know what all is out there. Right. So. You were able to get through it by leaning on those friends mm -hmm. and just not stopping. I know Jamal, you talked about this, that one of the challenges of being at a highly selective school is that once you're in, you have to apply to do anything, right? No. Are, there, are there a few things and, and Taylor, maybe there you could contribute to, the, to this part as well of are there things that you can do at Duke that don't need to, you don't need to interview where you automatically are accepted um, and embraced just so we can help some students identify uh, some of those places if they deal with the rejection that you're talking about, Sarah, uh, you know, where, where, can, where can they go? Where are their places? Are there any that come to mind? Well, firstly, uh, Duke Life, everyone is a part of Duke Life if you identify as low income or first generation. It does not have to be both. Um, that's a really clear distinction that we try to make. Um, spoken word, so like I said, I actually never did spoken word prior to coming to Duke. So um, it was something that I was able to kind of get in and, and like ease my way into. Um, I would also say like, yeah, that's actually a tough question. So those are the two things that I can think of, like, you know, that are application based uh, right. right off the bat, right off the bat. Any identity group as well is not application based. So like um, any like, like Mijente, which is the Latinx group or BSA, which is Black Student Alliance, like any of those, you're just welcome um, in cool. there and, and you're invited. So 
those are great places to build community because you're looking at people who look like you, who speak like you, who have similar, um, at least cultural backgrounds. So, Yeah. And um, I know spiritual groups, you don't have to take it. You, you typically don't have to take like a Bible test. They're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> spiritual groups are pretty cool at like welcoming you as well. Um, but I think that's interesting to hear that you didn't get into those groups and it made you question yourself. I think it's a really natural thing that a lot of people go through. Um, in terms of your most uncomfortable experience, so I have that. I'm going to chalk that up to you, Sarah, as your most uncomfortable experience at Duke. Is that fair? Okay. Yeah. So I want to know, Jamal, what was your most uncomfortable experience and how did you get through it? Um, I feel like I have two, um, but I will say the first one. Both. I want to hear two. <laughs> sure. Uh, and I'll, I'll be completely candid. I don't think that these individuals represent Duke, uh, but these are individual experiences that I've had. Um, so when I first moved into campus after the Rubenstein summer, um, there are these individuals called FACS um, who are like first, I don't know, first year advisor council or something like that. Uh, but they help you move in physically. Like they will grab your things and like take them up the stairs. For me, like as a person, I was like, people touching my things or people like me not doing the actual labor labor of like moving things was uncomfortable, but that's not literally the issue. Um, when I pulled up, I, I pulled up in a friend's car, like um, her mom like drove me um, and I put my things out and it w I just had two suitcases and it was literally every single thing that I owned. Like, and the first thing that was said was the guy said, oh my God, like we like residents like you because you didn't bring much. And it made me feel like, oh my God, like I see everyone out around with their family. Like my family didn't come, you know, couldn't come, um, couldn't take the time off work. Like everyone has fridges and microwaves and all of these things. And I have literal just clothes. Like I don't have decorations for my room. Like I'm not going to go out and buy them. So that was that like initial like what outside of the Rubenstein scholarship program like that initial first time with all of Duke I felt overwhelmed and subsumed I was like oh my gosh like I you know these people have all these things and I have two suitcases um mm -hmm. and you know so that was the first moment where I was like do I belong here like you know and in that same in that same conversation that same day um a fact was like oh everyone go around and say what what was your favorite country that you visited and I was like Durham it's Durham a country because <laughs> like I have gone nowhere else like so you know I first went on a plane my senior year of high school to go visit colleges uh, so I never had the liberty of going and, and having these like multi-world experiences so people being multilingual for the sake of like they actually had the opportunity to study that in that country is it's crazy second experience <laughs> girl so you, you really, you really going to get into it. Um, <laughs> so the second experience was I was in my dorm um, and an individual who I'm um, identified Chinese American um, approached me and I did nothing. I just sat there um, and, you know, I wasn't minding him any business. He approached me and he said, you know, um, you know, people like you are the reason why I didn't get into the school that I wanted to get into. And I kind of revert. I was like, huh? Like, I was like, what do you mean people like me? And he was like, you know, like affirmative action, like, you know, black people, like, you know, X, Y, Z. And I was like, excuse me? Like, and so I was confused because one, I was like, you go to Duke, so be grateful. And I was like, two, and I, I was like, where's your, 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 your dream school anyway? He said his dream school, I was like, I didn't apply there. And if I did, I would have gotten in because I'm a pretty bold person. I don't think I would have gotten in. Like, I don't know that, you know, for a fact, <laughs> but I said it just to kind of shake his boots. And so um, <laughs> that situation was something I had to take it head on. And, and we ended up having a long discussion about a lot of the inaccuracies that he believed of affirmative action. Like, so believing that affirmative action is a quota system, that's incorrect. You know, that was outlawed um, in Regents v. Bake. Um, so, you know, and like, just like hitting him with straight facts. Like, these are the facts of the matter. Um, and then we also talked about like the prison industrial complex, things of that nature, um, because there, were, there was more conversation. There was a overlay, like, you know, he later on said that like he thought black people committed more crimes so like dispelling those myths but at the end of that i do think that he's gone to a better place and that he has been more educated and i think that's a benefit of going to a global institution with individuals with different lived experiences because you can as much as you're learning you're also unlearning your prejudices you're unlearning your biases but in that moment you know i was like 
you know what, like, you know, and that's, that's where the phrase in spite of instead of because of really comes from. Because, you know, I did have to question him, like, was he right? Like, wh was it because I checked so many of the diversity boxes in one go? Or was it because I, I belonged here? And 100%, like, I belong here. And I've made, since those moments, I've made my time at Duke un undeniably, like, great. So I want to unpack that a little bit. When you're in a situation and somebody attacks you because of your race, uh, how do you offer a measured response in a way where you can then engage in meaningful dialogue, which it sounds like you did, and were able to dispel some of the myths and educate someone who was ignorant regarding a lot of the issues that you are familiar with, but you were able to do that uh, in a way that seems to have made an impact. Yeah, I, I think I challenged people just to speak candidly. So when he initially approached me, he was like, people like you. And then I was like, people like who? You know, what do you mean by that statement? Um, he like later tried to like beat around the bush in the conversation. And I, I'm like, speak candidly with me and know that like your opinions, of course, I'm going to d disagree with them. The fact that you feel this hesitancy to actually say your full opinion shows that there's probably some disconnect there and you know that there's some moral wrongness to, to mm -hmm. that statement. Mm -hmm. uh, but I challenge people to speak their mind 100% candidly so I can truly unpack or, or dis d dissect every single thing that they're saying so I can address it in a meaningful manner, in a meaningful way. Um, so I'm not, a, I don't run from the conversation. I don't beat around the bush. Like, this is not my personality. And when you have nine siblings, you don't beat around the bush. Like, you know, you, you say your mind, you say your piece. And that's what I do, so. Yeah, and then having your community of, I know that you're involved with Duke Life, but I think you were also mentioning, um, which is the other, the, um, I'm looking on our, on our information here. Were you involved with any other organizations where there were minority students where you can then go into a group situation and talk about the encounter you had and just kind of reflect on it? Yeah, so I'm currently in a program called the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship Program which is geared towards underrepresented minorities um, who want to diversify academia. Um, and so that's something, that's a place where I, you know, I felt beat a lot of the times in this past year just because I was so busy all of the time. Um, and I would come to those meetings, I'd be like, y'all, like, I don't know if I can do it. They'd be like, you can do it. Like that, you know, you're built for this. And so that's something, that's a community that I love and I'm so grateful to be a part of. Um, and, yeah, I, like I said, like, just natural friends. Like, I'm a social butterfly, and I think Taylor and Sarah can, like, vouch for that. They're, like, I'm always around campus. So just, you know, finding those friends and finding those groups of people where you can really just talk to. And, and Sarah and, and Taylor are two individuals I always, always talk to. Like, when you mentioned the uh, being far away and not being able to be in a library, like, Taylor and I Zoomed during finals <laughs> week and had virtual backgrounds of the library called the Zoom Perkins and, and gave ourselves 30 minute like breaks in between to talk. Like we were like, we have to t study for 30 minutes, talk for five, study for, just like we're in Perkins, just like we're in the library. So people like that, just finding good people. And there's so many good people um, at Duke and, and wherever you go. I love that. That's, that's, that's awesome. So Taylor, I want to know about your most uncomfortable experience and how you got through it. So my uncomfortable experience, most uncomfortable, actually happened to me last semester. Um, and at the time, I was doing, not last semester, like this year, last semester is in like 2019, um, in which I was doing a lot of stuff, like honestly, way too much. Like I was in like, I think three different clubs. I had three different jobs and I, I was just doing a lot. And, and, you know, as a Duke student, you feel like you need to do a lot of things. I guess that's just the Duke way, which is kind of, I don't like it personally, but me falling into that Duke trap, it's like, oh, I have to do this. I have to be in this club. I have to get, get these grades. I have to do this, do this, do this. And it was just a lot coupled with the fact that a bunch of the stuff I was doing was supposed to help my home life. So it just got to the point where like, I couldn't, if I focused too much on my grades, I neglected my clubs. If I focused too much on my clubs, I neglected, you know, work. And if I neglected work, that negatively impacted my home life. So it got to the point where I was just so stressed out about everything that I was like, I don't know if I could do this. 
but I don't want to drop everything because I love everything that I do. Um, and so it was just a hard battle between realizing that like the amount of stuff that I was doing was not worth sacrificing the mental tour mile I was going through at the time. Um, and so that was a point where I was like, well, if I can't do all of this stuff, am I actually a Duke student? Like Duke students are supposed to do all this stuff, make the perfect grades, have a good social life, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so me realizing that, no, I am a human being and I can't do everything under the sun and therefore subsequently dropping a couple of things that I was doing because it was just too much um, really helped a lot. So I think having, like, even though imposter syndrome can come in many forms, it doesn't just have to be like my socioeconomic status or like my race or all this other stuff. Like being a Duke student in its own self has a bunch of like criteria or like boxes that you have to check off in order to like feel like a Duke student. And challenging that, realizing that like I can be a Duke student without doing 20 different things at the same time still makes me valid, still makes me a Duke student, still makes me a person. So uh, the mental tor turmoil that you mentioned, was there someone you, you talked to? Was there a therapist, a counselor? You know, as much as you want to share, I, I want to respect your boundaries, but realizing that you had pretty much, over, realizing that you were overwhelmed and needed help. You know, how did you go about getting the help, making that shift? So I'd actually, I've had like, I've been in therapy since I think my first year of college because Duke does offer um, free therapy services, which I highly recommend to everybody. Love it. I love my um, therapist. So I was talking to her. She was helping me see it, but it wasn't, it was working, but it also was like, you know, I can do this. But then like talking to some of my coworkers who have now become some of my good friends, and like talking to some of my other friends and just realizing that like what I was doing was doing too much and I needed to take a step back really helped a lot. So just having a good support system and it doesn't have to be just my friends. It was also my yeah. therapist, it was also my boss, it was my coworker, all these people telling me you need to slow down <laughs> made me realize that I needed to in fact slow down and like reevaluate how I define my self-worth and who yeah. I was and things like that. Yeah. Well, that's, it's very brave to go and get the help. And I think sharing that is so important because I know there are so many students who are overwhelmed um, at many institutions, but especially when you're competing against yourself and everybody else, it's just so much. So thanks for sharing that. I want to start wrapping this up because you've been so incredibly generous. I'm so grateful to have you here. If you can quickly tell me a uh, typical Tuesday and a typical Saturday at Duke, who wants to take the Tuesday and who wants to take the Saturday? Who, who, uh, who's, who's a Saturday night person? Who's got the Saturday vibe? I don't know. Jamal, I'm kind of curious about you. I could do Saturday. Uh, <laughs> I, I want Taylor or like, I think Taylor would be, answer it better than I do. Cause I am enigmatic in the way that like, um, I'm social, but I don't go to parties and I don't drink. And I like, that's just a personal choice. I don't judge people who do those things. Uh, so I'm going to switch it to Friday, sorry. Uh, but Friday night. Uh, <laughs> All right, we'll take Friday. <laughs> uh, Friday night, there's karaoke. Uh, <laughs> there's karaoke uh, in one of the dining um, areas in one of the restaurants um, in the basement of the dining hall. Um, I do karaoke all the time and there's also trivia on Thursday night. So I do those things to kind of like have social moments and meet new people um, throughout the week. And Saturday, there's probably a general body meeting of any one of these like groups on campus that like, uh, oh, you can go to get free food and meet new people. So that's how I I do my uh, two Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. And that, that was not your question, and I apologize. It was even a better <laughs> answer. I think I need to ask the question, what's your typical Thursday, Friday, and Saturday? <laughs> that's I love it. I love it. Anybody want to take a typical weekday? I can take a typical weekday. Okay. Um, wake up. <laughs> and then what it's time? usually a mix. Ooh, that really depends on classes. I try to, I try my very hardest to stay away from 8.30s because I know myself and I know that I will never get up for anything like that. So usually I get up around like 9, 9.30, sometimes 10, depending on my classes. Go to class. Um, sometimes I'll go to work before class. Sometimes I'll go to class before work. I'm always working. So one of those two. Um, have to take a break for lunch. I try, I actually actively try at least this past semester to have my lunches to myself as much as possible because I'm always like in a meeting, meeting people at work, in class, 
people, people, people. And so I try to take lunch and my lunch is only 20 minutes anyway, because then I have to like go to work and go to class. Um, so I try to take those times for myself and just sit down, have lunch by myself, have a good time. Um, lunch, more class, more work, probably like at least three different meetings. And then by the end of the night, I am always in Perkins, which is the library. I'm all every single day. I am in Perkins <laughs> every single day. I am there. And I think that's also another one of my places I completely forgot to mention, but it's literally a second home just being in the library. And then after the library, I just go home. What time are you going <laughs> well, to go to my dorm? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On a good day, I would probably leave the library at like midnight. Okay. On a good day. See, how many hours of sleep do you get that night? If I leave the library, the fortunate thing about my living situation um, this past year was that I stayed in a dorm that was like right in the center of everything. So the library was like a three minute walk from my dorm. So I would just like leave at midnight, get back, take a shower, be in bed, sleep by like 1230, wake what? up at nine. So pretty decent. That's amazing. You get like a good if night's sleep. That's, that's yeah, I try to. <laughs> Sarah, then, do you sleep? No. <laughs> <laughs> How many hours do you typically get of sleep? Um, it depends. On the weekends, I do pretty good. Um, I, I will sleep in until like 10, 10.30. Um, but um, it kind of depends on when my classes are. Um, as like social sciences, um, especially my major in public policy, we don't have a lot of classes like early in the morning, some 10.05s, but that's not so bad. Um, so, but I, I do a lot of work in my room. Um, I don't really like to be in the library unless I'm with friends. Um, it's just like not a space where I can, um, do what I feel like I need to do because I like to play music or videos while I'm working. Um, I kind of need that kind of like auditory stimulation for some reason, um, in order to focus. Um, so I usually study in my room, but that means that, um, I feel like maybe because I do everything in my room, it means I have fewer boundaries about, okay, how late am I willing to stay up, you know, working? Um, so probably um, I'm usually getting to bed at like one -ish. Right. So you're, you um, sleep a little bit, so you get some sleep. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. one, one thirty, but, um, but that's like when I'm going to bed, not like when I fall asleep, because who knows when I'm going to fall asleep. <laughs> Right. That's right. up to my body. <laughs> right. So that's, it's always interesting to hear sleep patterns, but I want to finish things up and um, two questions. One is, did anybody get a D or an F or a C on a quiz or in any, yeah, Taylor? Mm -hmm. yeah. And did that shake you a little bit? Bro, it shook me a lot. It shook me to my core, actually. But, you know, we learn and we grow and we realize that C, you still get degrees. And they don't define us. <laughs> How do you get through that? Tell me, tell me for someone who gets that grade or maybe wants to avoid getting that grade, like what do you do wrong? What did you write? How do you fix it? Um, to be honest with you, the first class that I got the C in, I ended up getting a C as like my final grade, which really hurt me. Um, but I had to realize that like at that time I was doing a, I was doing a lot. There was a lot going on at home and the class, it just wasn't appealing to me. And it just felt like no matter how hard I tried, I still wasn't like doing as best as I wanted to do, even if I was still doing pretty well. Um, so I had to realize that like not every class is going to be that class where I get that A plus and I get a 4.0 type stuff. Um, and that even though I might have this one class or this one final grade where I ended up with a C, it's not the end of the world. It's not gonna like change who I am as a person. Like nobody's gonna know if I don't tell anybody. So it doesn't really matter. So. Right, there's no shame. I'm smiling because I mean like you're so amazing. I mean, you do so much. You're, at, you're waking up, you're in class, you're working, you got 20 minutes to eat real quickly because you're working, you're in classes, you're in meetings, you never stop. And a grade is just that thing that doesn't it doesn't define us or mirror our value in any way in fact I, I always think it's kind of 
it's kind of interesting to get a grade that isn't what we're used to because it makes us just have to stop and pause and love ourselves yeah, in a new way, in a new light because you know you're so beautiful and amazing and incredible like all of you i don't i don't use beauty in a way with gender um just in terms of our soul and our spirit and just the things that we are and you mentioned things at home and i don't need to get into the things at home but it sounds like you've said that several times that you're balancing lots of different things um which just is something that most people can understand and the strength and power you have and especially first gen students, it's just, you know, so much respect, you know, so much respect, it's incredible. I wanna quickly add to, to Taylor's like comment about like getting a grade that's undesirable. Um, I also wanna say that like, I think it's so easy to like get a grade on like your first test or even your, the same grade on the second test and believe like, okay, like this is gonna be my grade in this class. Like you can fight back, like, you, like here's my story. I had a fat, I had a sixty one percent in biology going into the final exam, and I was like, "Why did I not withdraw from this class?" And I ended up like the final was worth a very hefty percentage of the grade, and I studied my butt off, um, and I ended up raising my grade to an eighty two because I got it at ninety eight on the final. So it's like I didn't believe that those two midterms, those two tests that I already took were all of it. I was like, I need to keep going. I need to keep trying. I need to find new ways. So you j just don't, don't like be so self-defeating. So I did get to be in the class and I was like, you know, I'll take it. And that, that, that was something that I was grateful for. But if I had just believed in like self-defeating or self-fulfilling prophecy, I would have stopped. And I, I just decided not to stop. So like, just keep going, keep pushing. Did you so get help from a teacher or from yeah, tutoring? My friends, um, I was like, y'all are getting this. I'm not, what's the problem? <laughs> and so, and, and arguably, I also feel like the last few chapters um, of the course, like I actually enjoyed a lot more. So I was like more invested in it, but I decided, you know, it was, it was my freshman year I took that course and I did not know how to study appropriately. And it was one of the courses that like allowed me to study as strongly as I do now because I feel like I'm a really good <laughs> studier. Um, but it was something that like, I was just like honing in on, focusing on and, and yeah. So just don't give up is, is my whole story. Nice. And I think that's, that's so helpful for people to hear. Uh, the fact that you turned it around is amazing. Like that's, that's, just, that's just awesome and, it, and it, it wasn't your final grade. So the last question, if you can go back in time and give you a tip, you can give freshman you in college or we can give high school you a tip, um, something that you wish you had known that you've learned that would have helped you to just manage life a little easily, a little more easily. Um, you know, what would you tell you if you could go back and talk to senior in high school you Taylor? <laughs> There's a lot of things I would tell myself, but I think the number one thing that I would tell myself is to, in general, just always ask questions, but also ask for help when you need it. Because I am, I still am, I'm getting better, but in the past, I was like terrible at asking questions if I didn't understand anything, asking for help, even though I desperately needed it, because I, I, didn't want to like either burden somebody or put that on somebody else or make myself appear I guess less than because I have a question but other people aren't having the same questions just in general ask for help people want to help you they want to see you succeed they want to make sure that you're okay and I think the uncomfortable situation that I had this past year made me realize that if you have good people in your corner they're willing to help. Jamal has helped me in a lot of different ways that I cannot thank him enough for. A lot of my other friends, my coworkers, my professors, all of them have helped me. Once I started asking for help, I got it tenfold and it helped so much than I would have. That It benefited me a lot more than if I had just stayed quiet. So ask for help. It's not scary. You're not less than. It's perfectly fine. Everybody needs help ask it you will get it you will be thankful ask for help <laughs> beautiful asking for help is a sign of strength mm -hmm. not, not a sign of weakness it's a sign that you're willing to give people permission to share the things that are going to help you <clears throat> and they get so much benefit out of sharing like now you are all seniors so you get to be the ones to help so it's very clear like you want to help you want to help yes I Sarah, love to help. <laughs> yes you love you all love to help I, 
Sarah, what would you tell you? Are you ready? Do you want, I can go to Jamal. Yeah. If you're, if you're... No, I'm good. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So I'll say Sarah, um, what would you tell you? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, the same thing, but um, even like ask your friends kind of what they're doing. Don't, I, I think maybe I didn't realize that everyone else was like way far ahead of me and was already thinking about college and all of these things and maybe had this information that I didn't because their parents went to college and their parents are doctors or whatever, you know. Um, but yeah, ask your friends and be open with your friends that, you know, maybe you need help and you don't know, um, you know, the information that you need um, because your community can be a really big resource for you, whether they are just, you know, sympathizing or empathizing with your, you know, struggle or with your confusion or whether they might have the information that you don't have. Um, and they might be able to give you tips and say, you know, this is what's helped me or this is what I've considered or a resource that I've looked into and maybe this will help you. Wonderful. Thank you. Jamal, what would you tell you? I have two pieces of advice. One is for my past self and one is for my current self because we can always keep growing. <laughs> so the first is listen to advice and that's my past self. Because I think a lot of times, like what Sarah and Taylor are saying is super important, but sometimes we like have like a mandatory lecture that we have to go to where, where someone's giving advice and we kind of disregard it. It's really adhere and listen to that advice, it's a, allow it to like, you know, ruminate in your mind. I think it's super important to have those opportunities um, to listen to other people speak, even if it's unsolicited. So th that's the first thing, listen to advice. Um, the second to my current self in, um, in vain of, Taylor, I think, uh, would also enjoy this advice, um, and Sarah as well. Um, it's okay to say no. And I struggle with this. I still struggle with this to this day um, because you want to do everything the world has to offer. Um, that's, you know, I've taken, like, you know, classes in 29 different departments. There was no reason for that. I just did it because I wanted to do everything. But it's okay to say, maybe not today, or maybe I don't want to do this art class or, or take this chemistry class because my friend is taking it. So it's okay to say no. And I'm still working on it. I tend to say yes 98.7% of the time, <laughs> but that 1.3% used to not be as high. So, you know. Right. That's, that's a, a tough thing to say no and disappoint people uh, because I think you, I'm a pleaser. And I think that a lot of, I, I, I see a lot of myself and what I've been hearing from all of you. And I want to make people happy. And when I say no, there's a chance that, I might not make them happy, but what I've learned from talking to lots of students is, you know, you come first, and that's a really hard thing for people who want to make other people happy to recognize, but you come first, and the more you can balance and take care of you, the easier it's going to be to offer and give and, and get the best out of others. What? Thanks for reminding me of that. Um, you are all so fantastic. Uh, I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so thankful that you can be here. One last reminder, if anyone has questions about anything we've talked about, you're willing to answer those questions, correct? Right, you wanna answer those questions. And I think it's a great reminder to have all of you here and you've shared how other people have helped you. So if any of you have more questions, if you would like me to highlight other schools, if you have any feedback from today's college conversation, please let me know. This has been Duke University, a college conversation with current students. I'm Harlan Cohn, this is Before College TV Live. Thank you so much for being here and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks everybody.